early VHL teams and train them. We train them on what is called goal-oriented antenatal care. Goal-oriented antenatal care is a new package of antenatal care, which emphasizes that a pregnant mother should go for antenatal care at least four times. Through these visits, she would receive uh, a package of health interventions, including IPT, TT immunization, identification of complications that might complicate our pregnancy, and also identification of existing infections like HIV and others. So since goal-oriented antenatal care had uh, a component that our project wanted, that is IPT2 uptake, we trained these female VHTs in our catchment area and assigned them to help in antenatal care facilities. So what they would do is, in their respective villages, they would go and mobilize the pregnant mothers, the pregnant women, to go and attend antenatal care. This saw the antenatal attendance improve. And in addition, while in the antenatal care clinics, they would give health talk. When the pregnant women come, they would talk to them about malaria, how it presents, how to prevent it, what to do when it gets you, and even when it gets your child, what you should do. So this also saw the level of knowledge that the mothers had to increase. And in addition, these female VHTs would ensure that these pregnant women who are eligible for FANCIDA would take it there and then as DOT. DOT is a strategy being used by the Ministry of Health in Uganda to ensure that these pregnant women take FANCIDA, that is SP, as directly observed treatment. So this intervention was an innovation for medical teams internationally in Uganda, and we have seen it work. It has seen our IPT tool, which is the indicator used in assessing IPT uptake, increase from 25% at baseline, that was in 2009, up to 80% this year when the project closed. So we are convinced that the female VHTs, when entrusted and trained, they are able to do better than the men. In our country, men are not always very much committed, but we have noted that Females are always very committed because they are concerned about the health of their children, health of their fellow women, health of their families. And we think this is a strategy worth adopting. We have recommended this to the Ministry of Health Uganda and to the Malaria and Pregnancy Sector Working Group, Ministry of Health Uganda, and they think and they agree with us that it is a strategy which has really shown results. But we have also noted that uh, using these female VHTs uh, gave these pregnant women confidence when they come to the health center because they know when they come there's a person who also came from their village and is working there so when they come they easily connect otherwise others would get fear as I'm, i will go there how will i know my direction and whatever but this we have seen it has improved and it has not only helped in the increasing the ipt to uptake it has also encouraged even the men to come because when these pregnant women come the female VHTs teach them and tell them to come with their, with their husbands or spouses. So these men, when they come, the female VHTs also engage them in health talks and make them participate in small skits. So the men also get to learn the importance of bringing their women for antenatal care. So this has also seen uh, the attendance, the, the, the men accompanying their women for antenatal care also has improved. And we think this is a very good strategy. We have noted that this is a best practice, and uh, we recommend it for further scaling up in our country and also in other countries which we could be having similar situations. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Right, I wonder. In addition to that, in Liberia, what uh, we have done also is distribution of RTN to pregnant women at the health facility because we know that uh, a mosquito net. Once they are using it, help to prevent them from getting malaria. So the Ministry of Health, uh, in collaboration with the partners, ensure that pregnant women that come to the clinic for ANC visit are targeted for uh, net distribution. Global recommendations and best practices, and consequently many national policies for malaria diagnosis and treatment have evolved over the course of the Malaria Communities Program. Diagnostic policy in particular has been an important change following WHO's policy moving away from presumptive treatment. How have your projects responded and contributed to these changes at both the community and the facility levels? Okay, thank you. Uh, as concerns this, it falls within our objective too within our project, 
that is where we are working together with the health systems, that is where we are working together with the health management teams and the health management boards of the health facilities. So you find that we are engaged in building the capacities of the health professionals uh, that we work with to the extent that uh, up to now we've done the mentorships. This is a continuous process that we support as we are normally supporting our supportive supervisions that we move out together with the health management teams as they do supervision to other health facilities within their rural setups. Uh, then you find that the new regimes, the new policies that are there are being mentored onto the, the, the subsequent health uh, professionals within this setup. Uh, and then the next thing that you find we've been also engaged within this setup is also the informa health information management systems. We are also helping in monitoring the drug or the ACT stock out and we report, we help in reporting the same. Then you find that at up to now we've done the RDT microscopy training that we've supported working together with the Division of Malaria Control and other agencies that we work with uh, in partnership. Then we also done the malaria case management training within the region where we work and uh, the, uh, the staffs are already equipped with the knowledge and information that is necessary for effective management of malaria. To add on to that, uh, we've done the RDT pilot survey, the study we've done and the results are out that we are yet to share with everyone, but already within the system, we've forwarded up to the Division of Malaria Control and even to the USAID offices. So this is how we worked up to this extent. Uh, in Liberia, also, we noticed that we have been working in the community doing malaria control and prevention activities, but uh, the epidemiology report continued to show increase in uh, malaria cases, which mean that people were just treating suspected cases of malaria without actually doing uh, RDT or microscopy. Uh, the Family Health Division of Liberia uh, have the RMCR protocol where every ch any child that comes to totally the clinic with fever without doing any tests, you just go ahead and treat for malaria. So uh, this was actually increasing the cases of mal malaria, which was not really true. So we met with the National Malaria Control Program and the Family Health Division to make sure that they can harmonize their policy and now what has been uh, done is that before you treat any child or any case of fever in Liberia, you have to either do RDT or microscopy. So people at the health facility have been trained and it's a matter of policy in the country that before you treat, you must do confirmatory diagnosis and this has actually helped uh, to increase the uh, competences of our health workers and also those at the community level before they can treat any case of malaria. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, in addition to that, uh, in Malawi, uh, the project was part of the technical team within the National Malaria Control Program. And uh, during the implementation of the project, we noticed that uh, there was some shift in the terms of the policy for malaria treatment, whereby we have been using uh, SP, and uh, the country changed the policy to use of uh, LA, LOA, as uh, the first line drug. So the project made a crucial uh, advocacy in terms of uh, disseminating the change of that policy from using SP as a first line drug for malaria in Malawi to use of LOA as a first line drug. So the project made a very significant impact in that particular change of policy. But also, in addition to that, uh, the project through the Against Malaria Foundation, we managed to source some needs which we distributed freely. 
and that model was adopted by the Malawi government when they just uh, did the universal free net distribution in Malawi, which uh, happened this year. So the model which was followed in the country was uh, uh, copied or was modified from the model which we use in terms of the free net distribution in Malawi. Supervision is increasingly recognized as one key component of a successful CHW program and one that's linked to staff motivation. What kind of supervision systems did your project implement and what challenges and successes did you experience? Uh, in Liberia, the Ministry of Health at first was against giving uh, malaria ACT to community health worker to treat at the community level. So when we advocated that this was necessary, this was going to help to decrease the case low, cases of malaria at the community level, we were given the uh, opportunity to pilot the CCM project. And uh, when the community health volunteers were selected and doing our training, we know that people were at a different level. There are illiterate people, semi-illiterate people, so during the training, we noticed that supervision was going to be one of the key uh, if we have to succeed in our project. So what we did, we put a system in place, which we have our regional supervisor, which are RN, PA, or CN, to do the supervision of the community health volunteer on a monthly basis. Then we also have another level, which the assistant supervisors, then we have community health uh, trainer, which are peer supervisors at that level. So on a monthly basis, they supervise the community health workers at the community level to do supported supervision, to collect data and uh, analysis. Then we also have a uh, ME team that comprise of a uh, member of the National Malaria Control a program and also the community health services division and uh, the program manager for equip so all of us do each and every month we also do a monitoring visit to visit each of the community and each of those gcsv to ensure efficiency to ensure that they are providing the quality services that they supposed to provide tools that are used during supervision we have this uh, checklist that people, uh, that was developed. So as you go, each GCSV two kids are look at, their GCSV patient registered are look at, you interview the caregiver at the community level to ensure that they have been treated correctly and accurately and all these things are uh, documented. And also you have to look at the competency of the uh, survey provider, which is a community health volunteer doing your M&E visit. Of course, there were some challenges. Some of the challenges were by road conditions in the interior, especially those communities that are far up to the border area. Then we also have challenges that there's no cell phone coverage in most of those communities so that you will get there and the community health worker you're supposed to supervise is not available. So you have to make time to do several uh, other visits. And there were successes that we uh, saw in the supervision uh, system. We noticed that the GCSV, or uh, the general community health volunteers, were motivated when you go and visit them and see them. They feel like part of the system. And also, this also helped for the National Malaria Control Program to take ownership of the, uh, the case management program because they were part of the monitoring uh, activities at the community level. And also, the competencies and the work of the uh, community health worker were very successful. Thank you. Only one minute, man. Okay. Let me add a little bit. Uh, the MCP project in Uganda uh, relied basically on the village health teams. And we instituted a supervision protocol at two levels. The first level was a joint support supervision done together with the district health teams and then the project staff. 
we would go out to the community on a quarterly basis and visit the health facilities where our female VHs were placed. We would look at how they were working. We look at the challenges they had, challenges related to supply chain management, human resource uh, levels, and others which uh, were um, uh, interfering with the implementation of malaria programs. So for the, the findings of this uh, quarterly support supervision would then be shared at another forum at the district level. So this gave some e uh, element of uh, ownership and sustainability because we were using the already established structures to carry out the support supervision. The other level was uh, the routine support supervision which the project staff conducted, going to the villages and doing spot checks on uh, homes because the, female, the VHs were supposed to do home visits, so our project staff would go and visit homes at random to see whether these people they did the home visit, and also to cross-check whether the messages they were giving were consistent with what has been given to the VHTs to produce. So this uh, two-way two supervision protocol made to, uh, en enable that to ensure sustainability. Now that we are gone, the district will continue to do the routine, the quarterly support supervision, which is, I think, good for the project. If we hadn't this, if we did not have this support supervision design, I think it was going to be very difficult for us. Thank you. The malaria and HIV epidemics greatly affect one another, influencing both prevention and control of each disease. How have your projects accounted for this interaction or considered integration of care and support of people living with HIV and AIDS? Uh, thank you. Realizing the deteriorating effect of uh, malaria and uh, HIV AIDS on uh, HIV, the people living with HIV AIDS, we trained uh, home-based caregivers through the P uh, NEPI program in New Patterns Initiative. This is actually a PFAR program for our uh, HIV AIDS and the prevention. So we have used these uh, volunteer home-based caregivers to go house to house to HIV AIDS, uh, to people living as HIV AIDS houses, and uh, teach them the, how to use the uh, LLIN, a long-lasting uh, insecticide uh, net. And uh, uh, they, are all, they were also promoting um, in uh, seeking of treatment in early of their, the symptoms of this malaria. So we have been uh, engaging these home-based caregivers, uh, especially those who are, who are very experienced in, in uh, especially taking care of uh, people living with HIV AIDS. These people are uh, also these uh, HBCs or home-based caregivers are mostly they are HIV AIDS positive by themselves and they know how to treat these people and they know how to teach. And uh, because of this, we, are, we have tried to integrate these two programs, our PMI, PMCP program and the HIV AIDS uh, prevention and the treatment program. So, uh, so far we have gained a lot of um, benefits, especially uh, by integrating these two programs. And the people are, uh, you know, as, uh, uh, you know, children under five and the pregnant mothers, uh, these people living with the HIV uh, group are also exposed to malaria. So it was very important and uh, we have given uh, 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 very importance to address these people. And... Um, uh, by the way, you know, I, w I was supposed to add in uh, uh, how we are using, uh, you know, in addition to government structure, you know, the other community groups and uh, other groups. Uh, in Ethiopia, uh, our project used, in our organization have used uh, FEBOs, faith-based organizations, mosques and uh, churches. Because of this, we have gained a lot of a lot of results throughout the uh, the program, and you know, 
there was misconception about malaria. And uh, the government uh, was trying to distribute uh, ITN, you know, this mosquito net, to individuals, to householders. But because of lack of knowledge, they were not using it. And uh, the influential group of people are these religious leaders. We have used these people and uh, to teach uh, the community about how to use it. You know, because of the misconception, as I said, uh, people were not using that, uh, that net. Instead, they were using for closing, and uh, you know, they were also putting on the ground and uh, put some things on it, and they were not using. Because of that, they were sick and uh, they were dying. But uh, because of these uh, religious leaders, they, you know, highly engaged in the program. You know, we <laughs> I was telling to Julie and to others, not only r reading our reporters, but if you come out there to the field, you can see how your money changes the life of these people. And uh, you can see, and uh, you know, you will be proud of investing your time, your money, because people are, you know, saved. People are not dying anymore because of malaria. And because, because you know, the very instrumental uh, people who take part in this, especially this uh, with uh, behavioral change communication, the religious leaders. That is what I'd, I want to add. Thank you. In addition to that, in Malawi, uh, uh, if you try to link the malaria versus the H uh, malaria versus HIV as a project, we have the national uh, malaria prevention communication strategy. So, as a project, we try to analyze it and uh, try to relate it with the uh, issues of uh, cross cutting or mainstreaming whereby the strategy we mainstreamed HIV and AIDS into the malaria communication strategy. Why did we do that? We are looking at the uh, issues of HIV AIDS, and uh, when you look at the, the illnesses which are part of the opportunistic infection in HIV-related cases, you find that malaria is number one. So we are trying to bring the attention of the linkages which are there between malaria and HIV and AIDS, and, uh, most of the common signs and symptoms which are there within malaria or somebody when they just uh, have or had HIV, they are almost similar. But uh, we're trying to promote that uh, if the HIV, uh, in HIV uh, cases or people living with HIV, if they have also access to the use of long-lasting incest nets, that could do even better than uh, any other individuals. But also, we have been working with the National Association of People Living with HIV in Malawi, whereby the groups which are within the project area have been trained in malaria prevention, control, but also message dissemination. And when we are doing the universal net dissipation, these were also targeted specifically through their networks, so that uh, when you go back, you could have data for the number of people living with HIV who have managed to access the free nets within their households, and they are able to monitor the usage of those particular nets among themselves as a part of the target group. Thank you. And though your projects focused on malaria prevention and control interventions, your strategies and activities incorporated capacity building efforts for both communities and facilities in a manner that has allowed them to apply these skills beyond only malaria control. So can you speak a bit about capacity building efforts and how this links to the health delivery system? Uh, regarding the uh, capacity building, you know, um, after this program is phased out, who is taking responsibility in uh, continuing this project? And uh, from the uh, conception of this program, we have been uh, trying to build the capacity of the communities that we are working in, and, and you know, to not stop this activity and uh, to continue by their own resources 
but you know we build their capacity by providing the multimedia uh, you know supplies like uh, radios, megaphones, uh, tape recorders, and the different uh, kinds of tools. And uh, in addition to that, we have trained the uh, uh, faith-based organizations, community-based organizations like uh, youth associations, women associations. And uh, finally, we, when we closed out this program, and uh, they, we signed a memorandum of un understanding with the Ministry of Education, with the Ministry of Health, and uh, with the religious readers and uh, to continue the program uh, because they already gained uh, the necessary equipment and the necessary training to continue this program. Uh, it will not be uh, an issue of uh, sustainability about this program once they have their capacity is already built and uh, they have they showed interest to continue with the program. And uh, more than that, the results that they have seen on the ground can motivate them to continue the program. So this is what I want to say. Thank you. Yeah, also uh, as a part of uh, sustainability uh, strategy, uh, in Tanzania we also uh, train the uh, healthcare care providers. Uh, apart from uh, working with the community uh, health workers, uh, we also saw the need of uh, having healthcare providers, those who are working in various health facilities, uh, because these are the people who will continue working there, and uh, the pregnant mothers and uh, the under five uh, will be still needing their help. So for us, we train the uh, healthcare providers, especially those who are working in uh, reproductive and child health units. We train them in uh, focused and natural care. Uh, it's a comprehensive package which addresses all the issues related to pregnant women, uh, including malaria. So it's a part that work, our program was dealing much on malaria, but the package of focus on it, okay, it addresses other issues as well. So this it is another way of uh, making sure that the knowledge remain within the, uh, the, the, within the project area to be used by the pregnant mothers who will be in need and that should be under five, thank you. Okay, to add on to that, uh, the sustainability strategy we started all the way as we started our project, in that by the time we were identifying the CHWs, we identified together with the community, that is where we are having provincial administration, where we are having ch uh, church leaders or Christ religious leaders. So these are people who are accepted by the community, So, which means even if our project winds up, they are still accepted and they continue working. And then we went on training them as part of the capacity building. Then we also did the a provision of equipments such as referral books that they use to refer patients from the community to the health facility and they the channel of, of communication becomes two-way in that they also provide the information from the health facility to the community. So this is that is why how we work then you find within the objective two where the two are joined together, as I mentioned earlier, the CHIU is the link man, the link person between the CHW as a, sex, as, as a group and the health system as a group. So you find that they provide the information. And we talked about the CBOs, the community-based organizations that we work with and we subgranted 10. These 10 CBOs, they are trained all around, from proposal development, organizational capacity building, and all that, and even monitoring. So you find that now they can stand on their own and they can source funds from other, lo from other local organizations and they run health activities within the villages or within the communities that they serve. And within the 
our catchment area, we are having 10 CBOs or 10 community-based organizations. That means we are having five districts. Each district is having two community-based organizations. Then as we are also planning to wind up the PMI project, we are having the meetings, the, CB, the, the, the CHW or community units are having meetings together with the district uh, health management teams so that they know where we have come from, where we are, and where we are supposed to reach. So you find that we are not leaving them hanging, but at least there is a continuum. Thank you. In addition to that, in Malawi, the project used the existing health services delivery system. What we